Welcome back. So in this very brief vignette, I want to introduce you to what I would say is one of the main things that I hope that people get out of this course. And it has to do with one of my favorite themes, uh, which is something that I've learned a lot about since being at Caltech, and in part due to this great course called Order of Magnitude Physics, which has been taught by Peter Goldreich and Dave Stevenson and Sterl Finney. Um, and, and that is, uh, and then also through the books of Sanjoy Mahajan. So the, the idea is, uh, I like to think of it as uh, inspired by some scenes from the movie Castaway, which starred Tom Hanks. And this may sound like a bizarre thing to be bringing up in a course on physical biology, but in fact, I, I think it's not at all. So the idea is that uh, Tom Hanks was uh, an employee, I think, of FedEx and uh, he was on a, a cargo flight over the ocean and the, the plane went down in a storm and he was basically ca a castaway on an island for some number of years and while after the plane crashed he was able to recover a number of boxes that had been on the plane and one of them was a volleyball a Wilson volleyball that uh, he actually painted a face on and it became his his friend that may sound cheesy but I think it's actually quite interesting and and why do I bring it up? Because I, I bring, bring it up in the sense that I want to persuade you that there are many, many things that you can figure out by pure thought alone that you might at first cut think you couldn't figure out. For example, the mass of the sun. I think that with sufficient thought, a little bit of understanding of the maybe a few facts like the distance between the earth and the sun or and the period of the year or so on, that you would be able to figure out the gravitational constant. And then from that, you could figure out the mass of the sun and, and so on. And so the way I think of these things is, is that one's completely isolated. There's no Google, there's no iPhone, there's simply you, your brain, and your buddy Wilson, and you hold him up, and you pose a question. And the, the thing that you try to do is on the basis of just your own thoughts to develop an intuition for the scales of a thing. For example, you could ask how many tons of fuel, how many, uh, how many tons of fuel needs to be put on a jetliner that's going to fly between Los Angeles and Paris. And you can actually estimate that on the basis of the drag law that we're going to work out in a little while in a, in a later discussion having to do with the migration of birds between Alaska and New Zealand. And so th there's all sorts of examples like this. So what we're going to do throughout the course is we're going to construct fun case studies that are inspired by amazing experiments that people have been up to or by specific puzzles that, that at least have enchanted me. And we're going to try to use this sort of stick in the sand estimation as a way to develop a first instinct for what's going on in a given problem. So whenever I refer to Wilson, it will be in that context. And I want to say also, just as a tangent, that I think it's, it's very interesting to ask about the role of isolation in the history of science, and not only science, in literature and art and so on. And given that we're living in this pandemic, it's, it's very amusing in some sense to think that Isaac Newton was basically sent home from the University of Cambridge in the years 1665 and 1666, during which time he did his famous optical experiments. He more or less invented much of what we now know as the calculus. And he also worked out the implications of the, the second law of motion in, in the context of the law of universal gra gravitation. Another one of my favorite examples concerns Victor Poncelet, who was a French mathematician who, as a young man, had studied under Monge. He was a member of Napoleon's army. They marched on Russia. He was left in the snow for dead and captured. And while in his prison cell, he tried to reconstruct what he had learned about geometry from Monge. And as a result, he invented projective geometry. Thomas Paine's another example. I'm not suggesting that we should all be imprisoned, but when Thomas Paine was imprisoned, uh, he, he had made the remark, save the monarchy, kill the monarchy, not the man. So he went to France to try to save the king, and he was imprisoned and in danger of having his head lopped off. But he wrote his Age of Reason under those circumstances. So at any rate, I'm saying I personally think that it's an interesting thing for you to consider that the first time you get acquainted with a problem or the first time you ask yourself a question that begins with the two words, I wonder, then maybe it's worth your while to stop and to try and figure it out strictly on your own. So the, the, the sort of philosophy that will animate what we do often goes under the name of what are called Fermi problems. And these are basically named in honor of Enrico Fermi, one of the great physicists of the 20th century, 
Uh, there's a book that I couldn't recommend more to you by Schwartz called The Last Man Who Knew Everything that will teach you much about the, the very amazing Enrico Fermi. For our purposes, you know, you can look on Google, Wikipedia, you can learn something about Fermi problems, but it has to do with something that Hans Bethe said about Fermi, which was that he could find a numerical answer to any problem within 15 minutes. And I know of some of the examples. His wife, Laura, wrote a biography of him and said that in the winter he figured out how much heat was lost because they had forgotten to put in their storm windows. That totally makes sense to me. And he estimated the yield of the first atomic explosion on the basis of a very simple little experiment and so on and so forth. So I, I think that that's what we're going to try and stick to. And another piece of the philosophy of the course is that what I want to say is that if I can't answer the question, what sets the scale of a given thing, then that means I don't understand that thing. Uh, this is me, this is my own take on what it means to understand something. So, you know, if I turn over my shoulder and I look back to the mountains surrounding Los Angeles, what I can do is I can try to imagine what sets the height of those mountains. And I can answer, ask the question, what sets the heights of the mountains on, on Mars? And I'll come back to that in a little bit. What sets the scale of synthetic nitrogen use on planet Earth? You know, that's a great question, and it has to do with uh, what I like to think of as the, the Haber number, which is a dimensionless ratio that compares naturally fixed hydro nitrogen to um, synthetic nitrogen. What sets the persistence length of polymers? What sets the time scale for evolution? Why do I show the little prints here? Just because, you know, you might remember one day when he was depressed, he watched 45 sunsets. His planet is so small. What does that have to do with anything? Well, it has to do with the relationship between population size and the nature of evolution. And on a very teeny tiny planet where the population size is quite small, the laws of evolution are different than in a large population. And that's something I think, you know, that's another one of these, what sets the scale? Is the key scale time in evolution or is it size? Uh, and, and we could go on and on like this. So, you know, just to give you a sense uh, of one example, and I'm not going to go into the, the details of the calculation. You have the video. You can look at the right-hand side yourself. But the basic idea is this. If I want to figure out how high mountains can be, I ask the question, how much weight can rock support before it will be crushed? You know, if we were in the classroom, what I would do is right now is I would take a piece of chalk and I would stand on it. And basically you'd see that I would crush it. And so there's a crushing stress. The stress is force per unit area. And so what we do is we figure out, we take a column of rock and we ask the question, how high is that rock going to be before it has a mass sufficient to crush the rock at its bottom? And that's going to give us a height. The expression is shown on the right, which is height is the yield stress divided by the density of rock times the gravitational constant. That's, that's awesome. Super simple result. And you know, I challenge you, uh, if you were to use the G that's on Mars rather than on Earth, what height of mountains would you predict? It's something we may do in a, in a homework problem in the future. So anyway, what was the point of this little vignette? The vignette was to drive home this point. It's a, it's a true belief of mine. One of the most useful things that you can get out of this course, a technique and a tool that you can carry around with you, whether it's to figure out the size of a crowd at an inauguration, I'm sorry to bring up something so ridiculous, or the height of mountains, or how much fuel is expended by a jetliner, or um, the size of legs as a function of the mass of an animal. All of these things can be addressed using simple arguments of the order of magnitude thinking variety that I've tried to introduce here.